Turned to Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge, where I was responsible for the daily care of over 130 animals. And I'd like to take this time right now um, to educate you on a great deal of information that I was exposed to while I was down there. This is a photograph that I took in Kruger National Park. And uh, I waited an entire week just to get a glimpse of a male lion. And I was so excited. I finally had an opportunity to take a photograph, and I was blessed with a wonderful road in the background. So, <laughs> the story behind this picture illustrates the need to conserve big cats in the wild. This is a much better picture of a lion, but yes, Eppers, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> sure someone says something about trees? Little oh, Quercus leaves all over the place. That's because this is Brody. Brody resides in Eureka Springs at Turpentine Creek. And you will never get to see the wild African savannah. Brody was bought for $300 from an exotic pet auction, and he was uh, raised in a residential area. I don't want to bore you with these stories just yet. That's my favorite line, boy. So Turpentine Creek is a 501c3 nonprofit facility that's responsible for rescuing abandoned, neglected, and abused big cats nationwide. And all these animals, they don't come from the wild or from zoos. They come from private ownership and exotic breeders. Our mission at Turpentine Creek, once we rescue our animals, is to get them all out into their quarter to half-acre habitats and give them a second chance at life. Right now, I'd like to do a short, a short activity real quick. Everyone has an index card, right? Everyone with an index card, stand up. Everyone. And if you look around, everyone can look around while uh, giving you this information. Each one of you represents a thousand tigers. Fifty years ago, there was forty-five thousand tigers left in the wild. Everyone but yellow, please sit down. Everyone but yellow, please sit down. <laughs> there is currently three thousand two hundred tigers left in the wild. Will yellow remain? And pink also stand up. There are 30,000 tigers privately owned in the world as pets. Just to give you a little statistic. Thanks a lot, you can all sit down. Where do these animals come from? Primarily uh, exotic breeders. They're responsible for the large population of exotic cats in the US. And this is a multi million dollar industry that not a lot of people know about. These animals, for these breeders, are a source of income, and therefore a living creature is viewed nothing more than money in the wallet. Because of that, they don't really focus on genetics. There's high susceptibility to inbreeding. And as a result, you see a lot of the formies, which we'll see a uh, kitty cougar in just a second, and a lot of uh, chronic health issues, as we'll see with CJ the lion, Tigger the tiger, and Greg and Tammy the tiger. This is Luchi in Wyoming. Luchi's right here. If you can tell, he kind of looks bony. His back kind of looks bony. That's because uh, through the inbreeding and lack of care in genetics, Luchi is blind. He has terrible coordination. He cannot walk right with his front two legs. And he has issues with his spine. This is Kitty. And Kitty probably looks really cute. That's because she is. She's adorable. However, she only stands about to put off the ground. And Kitty suffers from dwarfism. It's another one of those things we see with the chronic inbreeding and lack of care in genetics. She was privately owned, and one day the owner's dog and Kitty got into a fight, and the child went in to intervene, and Kitty won the battle. This is CJ the lion. 
from a very young age, he developed chronic arthritis, and it's taking a big toll on his life. Just another illustration of some of the issues we come across. You can see he's missing his tail here. It's kind of cute, but I don't think it's cute because I love lions. But they will suck on their tails in captivity, like uh, a child sucks on their thumb. <laughs> kind of uh, this is six. He's doing what's called at the refuge a stinky face or the uh, Fleming response, which is where they're using their Jacobson rule. Six suffers from an endocrine pancreatic insufficiency disorder where his pancreas doesn't produce enough enzymes to digest his food. And this guy looks really interested in the cameraman is Greg. But Greg's very special because that's actually how his head is uh, permanently tilted. He suffers from a neurological condition, which again is a result of the lack of care of genetics. And that's his sister behind him, Tammy. Over here and here, she also has the same condition. So this is Tigger. Um, you can see Tigger's walking kind of funny. One of the largest practices with the private ownership of these animals is to declaw them. Now, if you all look at your finger and you see that first crease in your finger, that's your first digit. A tiger's claw is attached to their first digit. So in order to declaw them, you may have heard this with your common house cat, however. All right for them, but it's more detrimental for these uh, larger animals. And to declaw them, they have to go in and surgically remove that entire digit. You can see um, Cindy right here. She looks like she's walking on her elbows. By declawing the animals, you take an animal that walks on their tippy toes and they're now walking flat-footed, and you create extreme arthritis that increases as they're older. You can see she's literally walking on her elbows. Uh, this is a cat that we have to close some matter because sometimes she gets stuck out. Now, if you go in to declaw the cat and you don't properly remove the growth plate, the claw will start to regenerate within the paw. It's extremely painful for the cat, and you have to go in and reoperate. And this is a picture of what that amputation looks like, where the claw right here is attached to that first digit, and when you take it off, you have the claw at the first digit, and they're left not being able to walk on the two of those. Another reason for the large population of big cats in the United States are roadside zoos. And this isn't the type of zoo where you go over uh, across the city and you can find here in Syracuse, nor is this the type of zoo that's affiliated with the AZA, Association for Zoos and Aquariums, nor is this the type of zoo that works towards conservation. These are basically an individual that has a collection of exotic animals that he uses to breed and sell and then opens his pro property up to the public. This is a picture from a website zoo known as GW, who I just got a phone call from a fellow colleague. Um, they were just in the paper this morning because they had uh, five citations against them, thousands of dollars, um, where they're not following, they're doing everything wrong from using dangerous chemicals to clean the cages to allowing their um, faculty, uh, their staff members to go in the cages with the animals, and they just got fined for that. So that's your latest big cat news. Um, but here at GW, the biggest attraction is for you to go inside a small cage and play with a lion or a tiger. What most people don't realize is the only reason that that lion or tiger cub is there is to bring in your money. Now, another thing people don't realize is as soon as that tiger cub grows too big to properly handle, GW is responsible for building a new habitat for that animal. And the easiest way to get your $10 or $20 is to just breed a whole bunch of from becoming a pet. In addition to that, just to give you the, an idea of the type of people that we deal with, this man thinks that he's going to breed lions and tigers and ligons and uh, tigons into a saber tooth tiger. So I know you all think that's kind of funny. Everyone in here at DSF will get how ridiculous that is. Another reason why these opportunities are very bad is because illustrates to the general public and our youth that is all right to handle these animals. And people will go out and buy one for $300, $400, and then it grows into a completely unpredictable five to 600 pound apex predator, and then we pick them up. So this right here is Titan. He has a much wider face. Um, this is JJ, he has a rub mark on his nose, and that's their sister, Reese in the back. And they come from what I consider to be a typical roadside zoo, located in Quitman, Arkansas, where a man 
had a bunch of exotic animals, he opened up his property to the public and charged admission under the name Safari Park. Over some time, he was going through a lot of financial difficulties. He decided to cut his food costs. Four lions were so hungry, they broke their way out of their wooden enclosures, which is wrong to begin with, and attacked some of his other animals. And those lions were immediately put down. Which, by the way, anyone knows about the incident that occurred in Ohio two and a half years ago? When an animal does escape, the protocol is to immediately put them down. You cannot shoot them with a tranquilizer dart because I bet you didn't know that their adrenaline is so powerful it can override the tranquilizer. In addition to that, it's just like going to the doctor. You need to know the weight of the cat. You need to know what worked the last time, what didn't work, etc. Um, that's another important issue when it comes to owning these animals because there's no laws and regulations in terms of having a perimeter fence. So, that's the laws and regulations. There is no federal law and there are no federal regulations for owning these animals. Each state operates independently and that there's a lot of issues with that besides as crazy as it sounds. There's also a lack of monitoring the people that currently own these animals. So we're not looking to make sure that they have the proper cages and they're properly taking care of the cats and feeding all their needs. And this is a danger to the owner, to the animal itself, and of course our local community. I don't know about you guys, but in a couple of years from now, when I have a family and a kid, I don't want to go home and crack open a beer in my backyard and have a tiger walk by. That sounds crazy, but you'll see in a second it's really possible. This right here is one of my the current interns of Turpentine Creek. Um, what she's in right now is an old gas barrel that the East Coast used, some of the older houses used on the East Coast. And a cougar spent most of its life in there, exactly how you see it. And those are the type of cages that these animals are in. That comes from a Boone County Rescue. You'll see me after I'll tell you all about it. Knowledge of the animals. So this is Sierra. Another issue with outlaws and regulations is a lot of these people don't understand what they're getting themselves into. So this is Sierra. Uh, Sierra was privately owned and her owners wanted a nice tiger and they decided to feed her dry dog food. So what you see there, you see she kind of looks like an accordion. That's not because she was born deformed, that's because she was physically unable to develop. Uh, she wasn't getting the proper nutrients as she was growing up. And she's one of the sweetest cats at the refuge, but unfortunately she'll have some chronic health conditions to deal with the rest of her life. Another example of uh, why we need more education and stricter, or we need laws and regulations is Hercules. And Hercules is, looks a little funny when she said, you can see he has the typical large uh, front of a tiger, but he's kind of got shrunken, shrunken hiney. Uh, that's because he spent his entire life in a 6x4x6 six by by six cage where he actually physically couldn't grow and develop because his quarters were so tight. And his pelvis is virtually inexistent and his anus is so small that it's like the size of a pinky. He requires constant monitoring and daily medication. And this is straight from the Born Free website with the summary of the laws state by state. All the yellow is a complete ban on the ownership of exotic animals. All the green is a partial ban. So in Arkansas, where Turpentine Creek is, it's illegal to have many of your large convoys, but some exotics are still legal. Then you have the blue states where all you need to do is apply for a license. And then you have your white states where there is absolutely um, no need for a license or anything like that. Everything's fair game. So that means you can head down to South Carolina and see if Moto Drag Mark is down the street. So why am I here today presenting this information to you? Besides the fact that I didn't find out any of this until after I went to SUNY USF, this is really becoming a large issue here in the United States. As you saw, 30,000 tigers, and that's just tigers alone. This is India. Everyone knows what's going on in the Everglades, right? Everyone thought it was a great idea to have pet snakes and be like Steve Irwin, and then they could take care of them, so they let them go, and now they're multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. India was privately owned, and her owner, as she grew up, her owner was no longer able to take care of her. So he drove 60 miles from his house um, and dumped her in a forest. Luckily, tigers have an incredible sense of direction, and uh, as the story goes, she did find her way back home. She 
was on his porch very angry a couple days later. But it just goes to show you, it just goes to show you the type of people that uh, we're dealing with, where there's a lot of lack of knowledge and a, an extreme need for laws and regulations. So how does this connect to conservation and conserving big cats worldwide? I'm not sure if you've heard of what's going on right now in Asia, but their solution to the tiger poaching is creating tiger farms, where they literally, literally will farm tigers, and then once they're developed, they'll butcher them and send off their parts. Um, here in the United States in 1998, the USDA investigated six states and under the operation known as Operation Snowplow, you can look it up, and they were caught in the farming, the butchering, and trafficking of lion and tiger pigs right here in the U.S. So it's only a matter of time before we see these types of things increase to levels where we really don't want to What I encourage you to do and what I'm doing right now is take action. Whatever anyone else is talking about here, whatever any of you are passionate about, whether it's big cats or odinates, Inform the general public and let them know. A question I got at the refuge that I'll never forget, and this is a serious question, was a female version of a lion is a tiger, right? And this is sometimes something that, a sense that we lose here at ESF because everyone's very intelligent here. Um, and then we go out into the real world and it's a, it's a whole nother ballgame. So what I'm doing right now is uh, I'm fundraising to produce a massive documentary that's going to basically take everything that I discussed here today and more and then blow it up all over social media. We're doing it non for profit and we just want everyone to get the education out. So I encourage you to do that. Um, I'm working with my friend from high school, or sisters in the audience today, uh, John Mangione and Chris Capaluto. Chris does commercials for Carmel, Car Carmelo Anthony. Um, John works on Long Island's greatest radio station, and they're going to work with me to develop this film. I also encourage you to involve local communities. I set up this simple fundraiser for the document that, in turn, is going to educate everyone as soon as they see a tiger now and the statistics. Now, all of a sudden, they want to learn more. And then also involve the local media. Everyone's on Facebook nowadays. Everyone's reposting articles, and the best way to get your knowledge out about what you're passionate about is to just spread awareness. So now I'll take some time to answer any questions. Um, before I do my gift to you today, this is Bam Bam the grizzly bear. He spent his entire life in a farm. He came with another bear, a black bear, and a couple other tigers. And during my time at Chirping Tiger Creek, we built his $100,000 habitat by hand. Um, everything goes, um, we build everything in the refuge because we don't want to waste any money. Everything goes to the pack. But this is his habitat release, so you guys can have the opportunity to see what happens when an animal is seen nothing but a bar is finally. Did anyone have any questions? So how many uh, outdoor enclosures do you guys have now? We have 36. Um, we do cooperate with the USDA, uh, and the USDA does monitor our facility, so the fence height regulation just changed, so we have to tear down some of our old enclosures and rebuild them. Hmm. It's a quarter to a half acre, and that typically will range in price between fifteen and twenty-five thousand dollars for material. Are you guys shutting down the compound area? Yeah. Did you hear about that? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, you, how'd you hear about it? Uh, I knew someone that. Just Cool. Yeah, where uh, we just demolished our set. so we have a compound area. When the way the how am I doing on time? Um, you can finish okay. this question. Um, <laughs> our refuge started when a woman by the name of Catherine Twist, she was a really big breeder down in um, the Arkansas area, dumped off 42 lions and tigers that were housed in only two cattle trailers. So we immediately whipped up some cages and. Uh, put some cats in them, but now as we're providing this lifelong home for them, we really want to have the opportunity for them to carry out the rest of their lives and have that. Um, so we have a compound area that we're working on clearing and demolishing, and so that's what he was asking about now, and that's those original cages that we set up. Anybody else? So we want to help you with this fundraiser thing. 
Like, is there a website that you go to, or? We're um, launching a Kickstarter.